Welcome to Tales, Tunes, and Tom Fullery, starring Jerry Springer, along with Gene Galvin and me. I'm Megan Hills. We're recorded live in front of a brilliant studio audience at the Folk School Coffee Parlor in Ludlow, Kentucky. My daddy came And home. now, ladies and gentlemen, Everybody here he is, Jerry Springer. Oh, hola. Hola. Oh, please. Oh. Hola, hola. Um, um, still, well, however you say that. Hola. Yeah. You were right. Hola. Hola means uh, hello Very and good. Uh, viva la Cuba. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we just got back from, uh, yeah, we just got back from uh, Cuba. We were there for five days. Yep. And uh, it, it is a life experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I assume in the next year or two or three, uh, it'll be even easier than it is today to get to Cuba. Um, you know, relations are getting better and uh, doors are opening up. And my guess is hopefully very soon the embargo will end. And uh, But if you get a chance to go to Cuba, you know, that should be on your bucket list. Mm -hmm. It is an amazing... I'm not talking about the government now. Let's not get in arguments about capitalism, socialism, communism. Forget that just for the second. Just the Cuban people... Yeah. And the vibe you get from their culture there, that it is just alive. It is alive. And it was um, very exciting to be there. And I personally learned a lot. And you'd be happy to know that coming back, I still think America is the best country on earth. Yay! Yeah. And it moved say... up because it had been in my top three. Well, and it just like... <laughs> look at us. <laughs> I have to say, because I, you know, Megan and I, Casey Campbell, uh, our resident folk singer here, the music coordinator for Tales, Tunes, and Tom Foolery, uh, came as well. But there were times, Jerry, I looked over you. Actually, there were a lot of times yeah. I looked over, and you were not happy. He was pouting. He, he was, was pouting. pouting. Yeah. He looked, oh, yeah. He looked uh, yeah. depressed. Despondent. And yeah. I wanted to well, ask you yeah. what was that all about? about that. What was that all about? Well... So I'm walking down the street in Havana. Yeah. yeah. One block, two blocks, three blocks. Not one. Jerry. Not Jerry. One. Jerry. <laughs> Not a one. What? What? I mean, it was like, oh my gosh, withdrawal. Pain. His identity was ripped from his hands. <laughs> it's, been, it's been 25, 30 years. Yeah. I, I, I need that. <laughs> no, they. They didn't. They did not know who I was. Nope. And, what and kind of country is, is that? Which is another thing that Cuba had going for it. It was yeah. truly delightful. Oh, it was depressing. Now I know what you have to live with. <laughs> <All day. laughs> Nobody knows us. Oh, you know, one of the <laughs> running was jokes was that Jerry kept. It, it was really kind of pathetic, but he kept the count of every person that recognized him. That is the yeah. absolute And I might truth. have been on the other side of Revolution Square, and he'd be, Gene, Gene, number seven. And he'd be pointing to a person from Canada <laughs> this, or yeah. a person from America. And as soon tourist. as someone recognized me, I'd go up to them. I'd be hugging them. They were my best friend. Oh. You know, it was crazy. This is the truth. We came out of a restaurant one night, and this, this guy runs up oh, and says, Jerry, you know, oh, my gosh, you're Jerry Springer. He was from Fort Thomas, Kentucky. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Swear to God, yes. Fort Thomas, oh, Kentucky. He's now my incredible. best friend. Brian may, from Fort Thomas. He may come in here tonight. Because oh, I he, hope so. He was coming back from Cuba today and uh, set it as a goal to try to be here yeah. uh, before the podcast is over. And there was another. Uh, there were some situations, and I echo Jerry. I'm sure Megan and Casey do too. It was an amazing experience. Yeah. It's very stimulating, very enlightening. And as Jerry said, there were some peaks and valleys of the way people live. But there was a situation, or another situation, was that uh, we didn't see Megan for 28 <laughs> hours on a five-day trip. There's a, there's a gap. It's like the Nixon what? tapes. There's what? a gap 
a 28 hours. What happens in Cuba stays oh, in Cuba. That is not Fair true. Enough. Yeah, no. that, that's not true. No, the None fact of this is, is true. Hey, oh do you, should we tell do the they, truth? Do they? <laughs> what happens in Cuba stays in Cuba. Uh, yeah. now, do you, they have Tinder in Cuba? They do not. In fact, one of the guys told me the day that they get Tinder or Grinder in Cuba, it's all over. It's like, it's yeah. done. <laughs> hey, no. by the way, well, in fact, let's pull the curtain back a little bit, but uh, Megan and Casey, Jerry and I are like older, and Megan and Casey are like younger. And so Ish. I got up. Now, this is the truth. I got up in our B&B. Jerry, trust me, did not stay in a B&B. No. Is that fair enough? Or we, can we say that, Jerry? A, a and b yeah. <laughs> He was in a five-star. And by the way, what oh, is the, the, hotel the, the, what's I the Saratoga like? The hotel it's unbelievable. It's a, it? it's a five-star hotel. It was, beautiful. It, it was unbelievable. By anybody's standards. By right? anybody's standards. I mean, this could have been, a, you know, any place in America, any place yeah. in Italy, France. I mean, it was a... Beautiful, beautiful hotel. And I could look out the window and see the little people. Yeah. <laughs> and there were a lot of the them. The little... Oh. So I get up, uh, my wife and I and uh, Megan, Casey were in this B&B that was about maybe 15, 20 minute walk to yeah. this area. Yeah, but a great walk yeah. down the back streets of Havana. And I get up, kind of take a leak, you know, it's probably four in the morning. And I hear... <laughs> singing yeah and i go dude that's casey yeah it was there's a party going on and i went out yeah. into this sort of common area this b&b which is up on the second floor and casey with the two owners of the b&b who are right casey yeah. Yeah. here's casey campbell by the way he made it back Yeah. And that was Alberto. That was, uh, Alberto and Jorge. Yeah. Right. And Our so the four of them friends. are drinking are drinking rum, rum. and yep. playing music. And so eventually, about five in the morning, they go to their rooms, respective rooms, and sleep. And in the, I said to Bonnie in the morning, I said, "Let's take bets on whether they even show up." Because by the way, when this bus, a beautiful short tourist bus, government run and owned, when it leaves. It's leaving because yep. we're going off to the homes of folk singers around Havana to meet with them, to socialize with them and to hear music. Casey shows Megan didn't. <laughs> End of story. Yeah. I like. I don't know. And what we happened. did not see her for the rest of the day. For the rest well, of the trip. I sh you no, saw me no, at dinner. No. You saw <laughs> me at dinner. Well, yeah, you show up for dinner. <laughs> oh dear. Casey <laughs> became. What did happen? I, what happens if in you had stays? a really, really good time? Smile. Not yeah. Well, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Knock it off. Okay. Jerry, tell about yes. the uh, time that we were having dinner with, and we're going to just uh, describe this person uh, in a kind of a hazy fashion, but he was a retired, but a, I think he was retired, but a high ranking, really high ranking government official from Cuba. And yeah. tell them your lovely wife, Mickey, Gracious as she is, mm -hmm. takes the bowl of vegetables. The table was full of food. And in a privately owned restaurant in uh, Cuba, owned by a family, amazing place, handed it to Jerry and said, would you like to offer, uh, offer the blank, the, his title, some vegetables? And it and was what a high, you, high title. Mm -hmm. And what did you say? Well, I said, hey, you want some? Yes, he did. I mean, come on. <laughs> Mickey about died. She looked at me, rolled her eyes, and just like hid her head. She and could he not said, believe it. It's true. He, he said, you, yeah. "Yeah." He yeah. said, "Yeah." He spoke, yeah, spoke yeah. perfect English. <laughs> yeah, because in, in in that country, you're all equal. Mm, Notice yeah. I said you. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> you all are. Equal. You all are. Equal. No, but it was, and we'll talk a little more about that later. But uh, this gentleman who and the ar agreement to have dinner with him was that. We would not divulge who he was, et cetera. Yeah. But uh, it is fair to say he was really, really high up. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. important guy. Yeah, and and yeah. It, yeah, it was, and it was like a bonus. Did not know that this would happen. Yeah, right. that happened. And I'll never forget it. For yeah. two hours, I'm I'm sitting with this guy, and and and, and we can say because there were thousands, so it won't identify him. Mm -hmm. But there were, uh, he was a revolutionary, and he was with Castro. Mm -hmm. When you he know, came into when the he city. came in on January first, yeah. January second, nineteen fifty nine, with the revolution, so he was there through it all, and said that he didn't sleep when they came down for from the mountains days. for eight days, and yeah. said the city was uh, jubilant. Yeah. 
and that was the beginning of what they did. Let's touch on Casey for a second. Mm -hmm. Casey Campbell. Who was the star in Cuba. He was yes. the he star was of the Cuba. He was the star in Cuba. Yeah, I am. Casey Campbell so now sick has of people agents going, in Casey, Cuba. Casey, yeah. Casey, <laughs> no, Casey. It, you think he's exaggerating. They really, like, they fell he in was love great. with him. It was great. And, and, and by the way, there are, th this is not a joke, there are several people, we met some amazing people, and a lot of them, most of them like young Cubans, uh, and two of them, are working out what we hope will actually happen, we believe it will, where yeah. Casey will be invited back to Cuba. He's already been asked by one of the Nueva Trova singers, Trova's Troubadour, New Troubadours. They're folk singers. They're the counterpart of Joan Baez, Bob Dylan, Pete Seeger, and others. They're both young and old. And uh, in a minute, I'm going to ask you to define Nueva Trova because you, you do it so well and, and accurately based on everything we were told. Casey, after a dinner where one of those Nueva Trova singers was there. She's an icon in the country. She has her own TV show. It's all about folk singers, you know, unplugged guitar strumming singers. And so we go to this Pena, which is like a Cuban hootenanny in a little bar. And there's a listening room, bigger than this room, but not a whole lot bigger. Mm -hmm. Had a bunch of people in it. She sings a couple songs because when she comes in unannounced, her like, uh, oh, and her name it. is Marta Com Compos, and they call her forward. She sings a couple songs. They speak just enough Spanish to understand the introduction where she's saying, I have with me from the United States my brother, Casey Campbell. Mm -hmm. She calls him forward. Casey does two songs. When he finishes the second song, a Roy Orbison song, the one he started, I thought, I know how this ends, because it's, what's the name of that song? <laughs> Crying. Crying, and it ends oh, way, it's yeah. like Bolero, it ends it's way up beautiful. there, powerful. <laughs> they go crazy, and they say, encore. Mm -hmm. He sings, and we're going to, I'm going to ask him to do just a little clip of this song that he sang, but I will tell you that Marta Campos and another Nueva Trova singer who performed earlier that Maybe evening, Ray we Fernandez. saw him. Yeah. Ray Fernandez. Ray Fernandez. They jumped to the microphone yeah, did. and did backup and sang backup. And he so was cool. singing it in English because it's an old yeah. anti-war song yeah. called Down by the Riverside. Play, do just a bit of it, just Casey, and the little audience little will get a sense. First little verse for it, all right? Okay. All right. Well, I'm gonna lay down my heavy load Down by the riverside Down by the riverside Way down, down by the riverside We're gonna lay down at a heavy load, y'all Down by the riverside Let's study No one in that audience in that Pena spoke English except us, right. and they yeah. went crazy. Yep. It was so crazy. here's what happened. The four days after that, <laughs> dude would be walking down the street, and people were stopping him. Uh -huh. Casey. <laughs> oh, I was. Oh, every stop time I would. We were all the four of us were usually together, and if I was, I was walking one day by myself, and the one guy across the street goes, "Where's the guy with the beard and the yeah, guitar?" Right. For not and we where's said, Sherry Springer. And we said Castro. Right? No, no, no. On, well, on the, my last day, you know, actually, I can touch on both those points. On my last day, I met a guy walking. I just went and got lost in Havana for two hours, and you know, to see some things yeah. I haven't seen. Not twenty six, Megan. Not, not twenty six, but yeah. two. Yeah. And uh, but I'm walking down, and a gentleman does. I hear from behind me. Castro, Castro. <laughs> yeah. I turn around, he goes, I will cry for you, and uh, gives me so a salute. <laughs> wow. And which was kind of strange, but, uh, yeah. you know. Uh, it I've means called, you I've look 89 things. years old I've is what it means. Yeah. Life, so. Hey, but, let's go to Jerry Springer's yeah. music. David, I think oh, David has right. this ready. Oh, that's right. So we go to that, listen to this, Jerry. We go to the Malacon, the, the seawall, <laughs> oh, no. and these kids <laughs> pack the seawall awesome. in front of the city of Havana. And... They are, it's full of people, mostly kids. Oh, yeah. About every 10th person has a guitar, right, Casey? Oh, yeah, they all And have. so there's all this music going on, and you hear it all concophonously up and down the wall. So Casey starts to do Beatles songs. By the way, music 
is the universal language in any yeah. country. Yep. Yeah. And this is what it sounded like when Jerry, <laughs> this is the actual recording. This Jerry is Jerry this Springer too, and Casey Campbell. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, David. <laughs> All right. And then all the Cubans there raised their hands and said, we give up. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry was a hit. That, he was. That oh, yeah. oh, what a oh hit. it was what wonderful. A hit. It was so great to see Jerry be able to cut loose because as much as yeah. you kid about not being seen, which you weren't. And I mean, I mean, I kind of like to think I made you famous in Cuba. We'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You may, you may owe no, him something. No, he, Jerry was, you'd, it was a wonderful to see you in front of, you know, a group of people that none of which we could, any of us could really communicate with right. very yeah. well. All of us communicating through smiles and laughter and handshakes and music. And it yeah. was, yeah. It, it, it was it really, really cool. worked. It was a, per a perfect trip. Perfect. I'm going to ask Jerry in, in just a second, uh, really bore down because as we all know, he's, he's a great analyst and he, uh, he just sees some things that uh, I don't always see for sure. And uh, before we do that, I want to touch on just a couple of other things if sure, I go. could. Uh, and one of them is this moment since we've been speaking of the music. And this was uh, at the home of, and we visited folk singers, four or five of them, six of them, in homes. And this was a cultural exchange. That's why Casey Campbell went with us. And we hit the ball out of the park. Yeah. I mean, they felt and saw things and uh, vice versa. In the home of uh, Vincente uh, Feliu, F-E-L-I-U, Feliu. And Vincente goes back to the time of the revolution as well. And he's a very popular folk singer, uh, Nueva Trova singer. And I believe it's when we did Irene, Goodnight Irene. Correct. Because we were doing songs just, you know, some... Uh, doing songs, and one of them was uh, Goodnight Irene. So he had his guitar, Casey had his. We were in the small section of his home that was sort of his man space. And when we got done, do you remember he said, no governments can stop this, what mm -hmm. we yeah. just did? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's the point of the connection of music. It is the universal language. And didn't we have great tour guides, oh, by the way? Oh, my gosh. Sandy and... Ho and Ho they were great. They both, you know, they love Cuba. And one of them is native-born, loves Cuba, would never leave for anything. I mean, visit other countries, of course. He's a socialist, right? Yes. And just loves Cuba. But would even love Cuba if the if the form of government changed. In other words, yep. their love of their country goes beyond politics they're just so proud to be cuban which gets to the here's what i learned that i didn't get until he said it because i had asked him you know obviously they want the embargo to go because they're being hurt you know economically there's abject poverty there i mean really i mean we can't relate to it it's not to say that we don't have poor people in america of course you know economically of course we do but I mean, the scale of it is, it's not comparable. And uh, so they want the embargo to go. And I said, well, okay. So President Obama comes down and, and says, you know, our government is saying, here are some conditions uh, to have us do away with the embargo, uh, you know, because there's some political pressures here in America. And these are some conditions. So I asked him, I said, is there, if you saw this list of conditions, what what is the one thing where you say, no, we can't do that? That That is asking too much. And he says, the only condition can be no condition. In other words, what they're saying is, and I say, but, you know, what about, gee, let everybody be free. Let everybody pursue what to the best of their abilities, whatever they want to do, just like you're an artist. You you want to pursue your music. You don't want to, someone to tell you this is exactly how you have to write your song or sing your song. How, 
you know, why not have people be free? He says, we do want freedom. And I looked at him and I said, oh. He says, but we define freedom, the Cubans, as not having another country tell them what to do. In other words, they look, that is their definition of freedom. We in America believe freedom is not having our government tell us what we have to do. We want a personal freedom. They view freedom as not having another country or another culture or whatever tell the nation of Cuba what, how it should live its life, what kind of society it ought to have. And we don't even think in those terms. When I sat with this person that I said I had dinner with, he says, getting rid of the embargo would be great, but he says, basically, if there's one message to bring back to America, it's just leave us alone. Because throughout their history, they have been dominated by some major power. As I said, Spain, and then after the Spanish-American War, they get, you know, they get their independence, but then it's the United States, and it's our support of Batista, who was a horrible dictator. You know, I'm not saying people should say rah-rah Castro at all, but clearly it's pretty hard to argue that, gee, Batista was this good guy. He was responsible for thousands and thousands of killings, and he was an, you know, an absolute dictator, but he was our dictator in a sense. You know, he... He, he backed some of the businesses. When I say backed, he protected some of the businesses that we had down there. So they just, and then after us, it was the Soviet Union. Now, we as Americans, in those of us who are alive today or of a, you know, adult age, can say that we can justify, because there was a Cold War going on that was real, and so the, the worry about Cuba going communist was very real because we were in a superpower confrontation with the Soviet Union. And that wasn't just fiction. The fact of the matter is the Soviet Union really was expanding and taking over countries against their will after World War II. The Soviet Union really did go into Poland, really did go into Czechoslovakia, really did go into Hungary. So there's no, well, we're a big superpower too. No comparison between what the Soviets did and you know what our worries were here. So when, you, for example, you had the Cuban Missile Crisis, and we said we can't have missiles 90 miles from our shore, then what the people I talked with says, well, you know, the Soviet Union was saying, hey, wait a second, You've, you have our country surrounded by missiles, and you have those missiles now in Turkey on their border, on the Soviet border. And that's when, you know, I said to him, those are incomparable events because the reason those missiles were there because Soviet Union was taking over Europe. Now, here's where we are today. Even though we had justifications, I would argue, for taking a very strong stand against Castro and Cuba during the Cold War and protecting America 90 miles from its shore, from our shore, communism is done. The walls came down. In 1989, that's it. Communism has failed. It has failed, period. There is no viable threat that Americans have from Cuba. Do we honestly think, I don't care how right-wing you are, do you honestly think Cuba's going to attack America? Cuba's going to take over America? Do you shut your doors at night? Uh Uh-oh, here come the Cubans. In fact... I would argue that, and this is the discussion I had with this gentleman, there are things that if we had a decent relationship with Cuba, we as Americans could really benefit from. For example, how about the influx of drugs in America? Here's something. Cuba doesn't have a drug problem. Cuba doesn't have a crime problem. This is true. I don't remember in the five days we were there seeing, other than uh, some people in uniform, I guess, at the airport, seeing one police officer on the streets or one soldier on the streets of Cuba. Now, this isn't like they could control where we go. This was all over Havana, driving all over Havana. 
from the inside of a bus or a car walking the streets. No police officers. They don't have a crime problem there. They don't have a drug problem there. They have 100% literacy in Cuba. Mm -hmm. How are we doing? There are no homeless people in Cuba. Not very nice houses, but everybody's living someplace. 90% of Cubans have uh, owned their own home. It might be an apartment unit, but yeah. And you live there forever. And those that do pay rent, the rent is only 10% of whatever your income is. So they do some things pretty well. But significantly, imagine having deals with Cuba because they, what he was saying is, you know, we could really help you of the traffic of drugs from Central America, South America into the States. We know who these people are. We know when they're traveling. We can control part of this, you know, it's only 90 miles by water. You can literally take a boat from where we had dinner to my house in Florida. So there's no argument to have the um, embargo anymore. But having said all that, there's some good things that Cuba does do. There's no reason for us to have the embargo anymore. It's cruel to the people who live there who are the victims of the government that exists. They're not the bad guys. Remember, the Cuban people are the victims of the policies in the government we don't like. So why should we punish them? So let's get rid of the embargo. But having said all that, and I said this, in the bus as we were getting ready to leave, because, you know, these people were so nice to us, and we had, but I didn't want to leave the impression that, you know, when you talk with people and they're so nice to you, you're nodding your heads yes. At least from my point of view, I wanted to make clear that after 60 years of a revolution, they really don't have much to show for it. When you look at that, when you look at, at what's going on in Cuba for 60 years of some, uh, such abject poverty, their system, I would argue, does not work. Communism does not work. When the wall came down in 89, you did not see West Germans flooding into East Germany, East Berlin. No one's rushing to get into a communist country. Everybody's trying to come over here. Communism does not work. And even the argument that they have for drop the we're in trouble because you guys have an embargo, what I say back to them is I said, wait a second. If communism is supposed to work, how come it can only survive if capitalists invent, invest in it? How come you need our help? How come you need our trade? How come you need our investment if communism is self-sustaining? These aren't bad people. They just have a philosophy that does not work. Now, those of us who are liberal Democrats would argue that just like here in America, we have some degree of socialism. We have Medicare. Okay, there's the obvious socialism we have. So some services that human beings need should be provided by the government and should be the consequence of everybody chipping in. We call it taxes. So it has to be a balance. There has to be some socialism and some capitalism. And virtually every society in the world now, every country in the world, possible exception North Korea, is now a combination of some degree of capitalism, even China, and some degree of socialism. Those of us in the Western world tend to be more capitalistic. So we can argue what the percentages should be. I would argue in the perfect society, my point of view, we should have a capitalist society with the provision that four things ought to be guaranteed and everything else should be a competitive free enterprise system. By virtue of being a human being, you should be entitled to health care, food, education, and housing. After those four things of survival, let's get on with the race of competition. Because if you don't have that competition, everyone loses their incentive to try to, you know, if it's not going to make a difference in your life whether you do a good job or a bad job, 
After a while, you know, on a bad day, you're not going to feel the incentive to go in and do a good job. Why? What's the difference? Not trying to be political. We were walking through some streets, and one of our wives says, eh, just, it looks tired. There are parts of the country that just, streets that just look tired. It's old. It's depressed. There's no, you know, what's the hope? And what's the incentive? Wow, if I really get, I got this great idea. For example, you're allowed to, you can turn your, they've liberalized a little bit. So you can have a home and turn your home into a restaurant. But you're only allowed to have 50 seats as a restaurant. And you're not allowed to own more than one restaurant. So you can't create a chain. You know, so at some point, stop being ambitious. Well, we got our 50 seats. That's it. Now, that's just with restaurants. What about all these other fields? It's almost like you let people be creative with their music. Why don't you let people be creative in their everyday lives? What's wrong with ambition? What's wrong with trying to be better, trying to create things that you take? All these communist societies fail at that level. And most of the world sees it now. And I think in a few years, whether it's after the Castros are gone, uh, but I think Cuba's moving in that direction. So that's the end of it. Do away with the embargo, but don't for one second, because you can really get to love the Cuban people and get all caught up in, their, in the passion of their art and their patriotism and all that and romance and a revolution, I would argue, don't think for a second that that's a better way of life. We have a lot of things wrong. They're much better on race than we are, a thousand times better on race than we are. We got a lot of problems here, but there's nothing inherent in the system which says we can't solve these problems. There's nothing inherent in our system which says we have to treat blacks or Muslims or uh, Hispanics badly or differently or discriminate. So keep our arguments separate. I think it's perfectly okay to have a free enterprise system. I think that's worth defending, worth fighting for, etc. But we could do better on human relations. And that's what I learned from this trip. And, and also, maybe. I don't like being in a country where I'm not known. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite takeaways, and our guide, Jesus, said it. He, he, and he told me, he said it was his favorite quote from the entire trip, was I asked Jerry, because some, uh, someone who did recognize him came over and got a picture taken, and I said, Jerry, does it ever get to you that people come up and, you know, will interrupt you during a, a drink or whatever and, and want a picture? And, and Jerry said, I live in constant fear of not being known. <laughs> That's well and Jesus, Jesus just lost it. He yeah. thought that was the funniest I, thing. It, but you said it so earnestly. That was like, oh, I live yeah. in was very You don't know the fear. tightness in my chest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not healthy. And maybe surprisingly or unsurprisingly, I, uh, Gene Galvin, was the one who was throughout the trip uh, the most pro-capitalism, the mo <laughs> oh, the most... Oh, you, we you about lost sold you. out. Look <laughs> at that. <laughs> he sold <laughs> out. What, what the listeners... The TV worried. cameras are gone yes. for our listeners. Yeah, I know. We have a T-shirt TV on. people here. I'm worried so that I, someone will take a picture of me next to you, and yeah, I'll be, I mean, we, we and I'll be viewed close. as a fellow traveler. <laughs> real close to Hey, by the way, Melvin. let's uh, get a little more specific about uh, Jesus... Uh, Noguera, and, and let me tell you who he is. And this is an interesting wrinkle about Cuba, it gives another insight. So he was a member of the Young Communist League from a little child, grade school age, through the age of 30. At the age of 30, all Cubans decide who were members of the Young Communist League, whether they're going to join the Communist Party and be in that party for the rest of their lives. And uh, Jesus said at age 30, and his father, who after the revolution could not read one word as an adult, and he learned to read, he became a ranking government official, and Jesus was part of the Young Communist League, then said, uh, no thank you, but I won't be part of the party, uh, but he's still very much a socialist, would very you much. agree? Very, very committed, patriotic, yep. Cuban, and, and a socialist. 
And he said, he was so ecstatic when I told him, I asked him, I said, is it okay if we go back to the U.S. and give your name and contact information and urge people to contact you via email to be their guide? He's a professional translator and tour guide. He was amazing. Would you guys agree? Oh, he was, yeah, he was, he was smart. Absolutely he was great. The he connections was, he yep. had. He knew the, everybody. Oh. Yeah. He solved all the problems. So I'm going to do that now. And there's one other thing we're going to do with Jesus, but let me first give his contact information. I'm going to make it easy because I have his email address in front of me. I'm going to give his name again. Jesus Noguera Ravelo. And if you email me, his email's too long and it's not what we're familiar with. If you email me at gene at jerryspringer.com, gene at jerryspringer.com. Gene. gene is with a J. So instead of G-E-N-E, it's J-E-N-E. So J-E-N-E at jerryspringer.com. I will route all of you to him. He will be ecstatic. If you're planning a trip to Cuba, he would be anxious to be your tour guide. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, we asked him, and he has agreed to be part of the Jerry Springer podcast in the future. Periodically, we will have an element of the podcast called Ask the Cuban Socialist. Yes. And what you'll be able to do... <laughs> this is true. This is, is all true. send emails to gene at jerryspringer.com, and then we will uh, read... We'll get him on the phone. Yep. He has a cell phone. Yes. And it, I, just, I could call him right now, just dial straight through. Yep. We'll put him on the air, and then we'll do like a five, ten-minute segment where you get to ask the Cuban socialist a question that we're not thinking of. Yeah, and he was at one point a, a, a communist, and, and what I said, because his name's Jesus, uh, Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, yeah. I said, how, do you, how can you believe in communism when they don't believe in you? Oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's cute. No, you know, it it's is a, it's know, actually a Catholic country, though, not practicing no, a whole they, lot. Yeah, no, they but say. there are Jewish synagogues, uh -huh. and our, one yes. of our mutual friends, uh, Louis uh, Beck, I think we can say, wouldn't mind, uh, went to Cuba with a, a Jewish group, a group of people from I think, probably one synagogue, if yes. not more, mm -hmm. and they went to synagogues in Cuba. And they, Lewis told me that they even said to him there was a time when Castro showed up and they chastised him for not coming around much. And this uh, rabbi said for a time, months, Castro came regularly as a commitment to, you know, I don't want to forget you people any more than anybody else. And four popes, didn't they say four popes yeah. had yeah. been to Cuba? Benedict, yeah. So it's not an oh, anti-necessarily uh, religious country. You know, it's a lot of things, but it's probably not that. Here's something that's really interesting. El Paquete. Oh, that's right. Oh, right. One right, of the things right. that happened on this trip was sort of spontaneous. We knew nothing of this. We knew nothing of the meeting. In fact, Jerry made the meeting with the ranking government official by saying to the Center for Cuban Studies set this up for us. They're in the United States or in right. New York City in Manhattan. And they hooked us up with Jesus. Sandy Levinson. And Sandy, Sandy Levinson, Levinson was with us yes. most of the time yep. of all the time she we were there. Fantastic. Yes. She knows everybody. Literally She took everybody. us places that were amazing. She learned how to cut sugarcane as a member of the Venceremus Brigade back in the 70s, where some Americans, very controversial, I'm going to admit, went to Cuba illegally and uh, went into the sugarcane fields and cut cane. Venceremus Brigade. Yep. Fidel Castro taught her how to cut sugarcane. She's like that yeah, uh, that savvy level. and... Uh, She's just very skilled and sort of finding her way around. So she told us about, maybe Jesus told us about El Paquete. No, it was Jose. Jose, Jose. another member of our the team of people that helped us. It's translated the packet. The packet, yep. Megan, tell what the packet is. and So essentially, I mean, obviously they have difficulty getting transmissions from the United States or any other country. So what they do is somebody, and they're very open with piracy. They, they encourage piracy, in fact. So what they do is they'll go into Miami or wherever's closest, and somebody will download hundreds of episodes of television, movies, everything like that. They then bring it back to Cuba to their Movies and songs. Movies yeah. and songs, television shows, everything. They then bring it back to their neighborhoods, and they pass it around, and everyone borrows it and pays a dollar for it for an extended amount of time and then they give it back and this goes on and on and on so it was just a way to kind of infiltrate so jerry of course being the humble man that he is says well am i on there am i on el paquete <laughs> it turns out he was not because they don't know how to translate bleep they don't there's no <laughs> translation <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Otherwise, my, Otherwise show would, my show would clearly be on. 
But it was that, so yeah, that was that you have was to, yeah. Well, bleep with a you know a, a Spanish accent. I don't know how that would even go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Try it. Bleep. <laughs> He bleepa, 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 bleepa. And so Jerry actually did an interview. They got all That's excited. Right. They, they didn't know who Jerry was. The El Paquete. Oh, you keep bringing no. that up. <laughs> no, but check this out. No one knew who the he El Paquete was. people didn't know who Jerry was, but they knew about Christine, Christina, Christina. Tell she, about Christina. Christina uh, has a very similar talk show, but in Spanish. And she does it out of Miami. And I guess she started a couple of years after we did. And it's very good. I mean, it's a very successful show. And in the uh, in Central and South America and the Caribbean, it's a very popular show. It's, it's exactly like ours. It has that great quality that you would, you know. The quality. It, it was. Uh, the ethics. Yeah, the the it morality. Was, uh, <laughs> it was high-grade television. And she yeah. has that show. So we could do it with subtitles. There but again, it would just be. <laughs> bleep. Yeah. <laughs> So the Al Paquete people asked if they could meet with Jerry, which they did in the lobby mezzanine level of the Saratoga, yep. and they interviewed him for their digital magazine, relating it to Christina, and they are now going to take the, the probably, well, not probably it's going to be on the Al Paquete's digital magazine to now learn about Jerry. They also interviewed Casey Campbell, and Casey, I think, gave them, or you're sending them some of your material, yep, right? correct, yeah. They're, uh, the uh, young woman we talked to, Maria Carla, she said she would, uh, or and Jose said as well, that they would get the music section uh, in, uh, or, or my music into the music section of the... And of by the so way, now it's a race Cuba <laughs> aside for a moment, your CD, Casey, yeah. and I'm telling you, Figure it out. Call up, email. But people have to listen to this CD. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, we listened to it yep. at home last night. Uh, Mickey and I listened to it, and honestly, uh, with tears in our eyes. I mean, it is it is that beautiful. You think I'm just exaggerating because he's it is beautiful. I mean, the nice. ballads are. It is the writing because you write these songs, and then. The music of it, it's, uh, there's no reason you shouldn't be a huge star. I mean, oh. almost as big as me. Yeah. <laughs> you could be. Well, you, can I ask you a question, Jerry? Not I'm, own your own I'm jet sitting here star, but. <laughs> trying to think how to ask this. There's a guy that we met with, one of the Nueva Trova singers. Tell what Nueva Trova is, Jerry, because you have a nice, uh, succinct way of explaining. It, it means new troubadours, but what are the, yeah, what's the essence of their the music? music? Their music is a two-pronged, it, it's love songs, but it's two-pronged. Half of the music is the traditional love ballads that we have here in the States, and the other half is a love affair with Cuba. And, uh, and they sing about it as... You know, if we sing uh, the, during the seventh inning, America the Beautiful or something like that, but it, it, there's, the music is so poetic, and there were a number of people writing this music and performing it. So in 1972, they got together, because now the revolution was clearly in place. It was in the early days where no one knew exactly how far they could go, what would happen. So there was a little more sense of stability, these musicians uh, got together and started this movement. They've always had troubadour music, folk music, but now this was the new folk music. And it would reflect not just the revolution, but generally their love of Cuba, as well as romantic songs. And we met with the people that started this movement, the people that are popular in the movement today, and we was really amazed. I mean, they would invite us into their homes, and we would sit around and have... The Cuban coffee is unbelievable. Starbucks will not make it over there because... Oh, it's so good. Oh, not because I don't love Starbucks, but because they just love their coffee, and it is. It's amazing. Um, and, and, cigars. Rum, and cigars. And cigars being smoked everywhere. Cigars every place rum. And, and rum. <laughs> and so you sit in their homes, and they bring their family in. You know, the wine. Rum at 11.30 in the morning. In the morning, the Oh, yes. so frankly, I don't remember what they said, but... <laughs> It was, yeah, and and, and you were they, really game with that too. Good for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they uh, they just talk about their passion, and you know they'd be talking, and then they start singing a song yeah. and stuff like that. They'd answer our questions. They didn't dodge any question. Yeah. 
I had to, which is rare for me, I had to be a filter on not getting too, on myself, on not getting too argumentative because, you know, we'll always say, oh, if I could only get one of them, I'd tell them, how crazy are you? What are you doing? What are you doing? So, you you know, you, you, you certainly, you're in someone else's home. You want to be polite. You want to really learn from them without being too argumentative. And um, it was fascinating. I, I You know, you, at my age, you don't get too many really new experiences. Everything is just a different style of what you've done your whole life. But this really, really was new. And with joking aside, for me, not being known really removed all... There was just a blatant honesty because... If you are known, any meeting you have with someone, any conversation you have is tilted somewhat because they come with a preconceived notion of who you are and what you should, you know, how many times have we talked about someone and then you suddenly meet them in person? Oh, could I have a picture? Could I have an autograph? <laughs> but as soon as you walk away, you say, that son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah. Hey, let me <laughs> mention the yeah. names and, and send a shout out all the way to Cuba to the some other folk singers we met with whom... We haven't mentioned Alberto Falla, Augusto Blanca, Angel Quintero, Heidi Aguilada. And by the way, Alberto Falla, we were meeting with, remember, we were with him at a dinner in the same restaurant that uh, President Barack Obama was in about three weeks before oh, on his visit to Cuba. We Again, a restaurant Cristobal. in a home. I left a bigger tip. He probably did. <laughs> And get this, Alberto Falla tells, because if we look at these guys, and if they look like they were old enough to have been in the revolution, we started asking questions. And he explained to us that he was at Playa Geron. Which we call the Bay of Pigs. We call the Bay of Pigs. Uh, they went from a, a sort of the revolutionary square after some speeches were given. It was actually when Fidel Castro announced the socialist revolution. That coincided with when bombs were being dropped on airports in Cuba with the invasion of what we call the Bay of Pigs. So Alberto Falla, one of their iconic folk singers, uh, jumped probably in a jeep with other guys. He told us he was part of the voluntary militia. They went to Playa Giron, and he was part of 60 guys, he estimated, who surrounded Fidel and protected him during that moment. Now, I suppose if a bomb would have been dropped, they all would have been dead, but they, that didn't happen. And they were probably kind of celebrated heroes for a period of time. That That's how they felt about the revolution, about Fidel. And again, all can judge this various ways, but there's a lot of passion in Cuba for mm -hmm. all of that. And that's not too long ago, 1959. And no, we didn't see patri we didn't see propaganda banners hanging, but we did see a lot of statues Lots. and monuments to their heroes. Yep. Yep. Che Guevara, obviously prominent among them, uh, Fidel, etc. So uh, let's say thank you to Cuba for a oh, great experience for and us. If I may, real quick, Gene, I would like to personally say thank you to Jerry and thank you to you and thank you guys for putting this together because this was, and I think Casey can echo it, this was just such a life changing, wonderful experience for us. So yeah, thank truly. you, Jerry. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. We, we all agree on that. Uh, we have a, I found the other day, because these guys are always on me about the business plan for the Jerry Springer podcast, and I found what it the business other day. plan? I was shocked at how you small send me a bill and say this is. I, I was shocked <laughs> to see how small the business plan is on a piece of paper, and basically when I read it, and I had written it, I'd forgotten. It says Jerry gives Gene money and Gene spends it. Repeat. That's, That's it. the it. business plan. <laughs> so thank you to Jerry Springer. Let's use that. So now that I think about it. I'm not much of a capitalist at all. I'm not making any <laughs> oh, money. You're you know, I will this say this too. It is, you know you're in a different world when Jerry Springer is the most conservative man in the room. It was very, well, very that's different. Good point, Megan. Hey, Megan. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> right on. <laughs> yeah, these guys are going, oh, yeah, man, you guys are right. I go, whoa. <laughs> Back off. Hey, we have with us, and we're very excited about this, the Downhill Strugglers, and they are from New York City. And uh, they're very prominent in our own Nueva Trova movement in America. And uh, they have an album out that's called Show Me the Way to Go Home. And we're going to ask them to do uh, a song for us. All right. Well, we got a tune here, a good Kentucky tune called Ladies on a Steamboat. 
Strugglers, and uh, by the way, you can hear their music at downhillstrugglers.com, and I suspect that's where they could get your CDs, correct? Yeah, that's, that's correct. And uh, members of the group are Jackson Lynch and Walker Shepard. And we've also got a third member, Eli Smith, who actually couldn't be here with us today. And there was a death, uh, not in the family, but in but a in very close, close family. Close yeah. family. So, um, yeah. so he's spending time with the family, and we're just out here getting along without him. Yep, that, that's uh, how it happens. It's a huge coincidence that we know who that death was because when we were in Cuba, remember Sandy Levinson yeah. was very upset one night about the death of somebody back in New York, and she knows Eli because she knows her family, yeah. Sandy Levinson of the Center for Cuban Studies. Right. You, guys, you guys perform at the Jalopy Theater some in, that's right. in uh, Brooklyn, mm -hmm. correct? That's correct. Um, and what brings you to the Midwest? Um, well, we've been on a little tour here. Um, we were, we've been out on the road now about three weeks, and we've been down in Atlanta. You running out of laundry? Oh, man. <laughs> we just, uh, yeah, we stop at the Goodwills about every couple of days to yeah. pick up a new wardrobe there. But, um, yeah, we've been down in Atlanta. We were playing um, a couple, couple of uh, festivals in East Tennessee, playing uh, Louisville the other night, and so Good we're just you. kicking Good around. That. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And, uh, and there are similarities between what we hear from guys like you, Casey Campbell, and others, and what we heard from, about people who are doing the same thing in Cuba. It's true in any country, I'm sure. Yeah, every country has its great. Would you do a second song for us? music, yeah. We, got, right. we got one called uh, Goodbye, Honey, I'm Gone. Okay. Downhill Strugglers.
What I... That was great. Now, I just noticed something, and maybe I've seen it before, but I honestly don't remember. You were singing while playing the fiddle, and so how do you... Because, you know, normally you, you, someone's playing the fiddle, and then they're, it's time to sing, so they kind of put the fiddle to their side, and they lean into the mic and sing. But your chin was up against the fiddle while you were singing, so your head was bad because your chin couldn't keep going up. And, so <laughs> the head... Is that normal? I mean, it was... It was <laughs> I, I was know, wondering the same thing. Me, I really, yeah. It was great. It was great. Yeah. It really was. I mean, the quality of the voice while you're doing that. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't work out. But. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a downhill strugglers. They're really good. Yeah, they are. And from New York City. And we want to ask you guys if you would take us out on Lead Belly's uh, Good Night, Irene. We would love to. We would love to. All right. I love Irene, God knows I do. You've been listening to Tales, Tunes, and Tom Foolery, recorded live at the Folk School Coffee Parlor in Ludlow, Kentucky. Thanks to Patrick Kennedy for writing our opening song, and to you for listening. Check out our website at jerryspringer.com. Sometimes I live in the country And sometimes I live in town He's got that Cuban sound Sometimes I take a great notion To jump in the river and